So let's start the first session with a, with a local. Our first speaker is Faye Dauker, who's going to speak about the dynamic of the lot. Three references, if you just um, Google um, Raphael Sorkin or search for him on the archive, you'll come up with um, these three papers. <coughs> the general covariance of general relativity implies that there's no physical meaning to the notion of a state at a moment of time. So reality in general relativity has instead a fully four dimensional character. And we don't know yet how general relativity and quantum theory will be reconciled. But if we take this space-time nature of reality in GR to heart, then I propose, I suggest that state should play no fundamental role in quantum mechanics either. And in fact, relatively little effort has been devoted to pursuing this idea, this idea that quantum mechanics should be founded on the concept of history, should have a space-time or four-dimensional character, and should not be founded on the notion of state. So a major step was taken um, in pursuing this idea by Dirac and Feynman. We showed that the dynamics of quantum mechanics could be um, expressed in terms of a sum over histories. But very relatively few physicists have taken up this um, idea of founding quantum mechanics, um, founding quantum theory on histories. And notable exceptions include Griffiths, Onnes, Gelman, and Hartle, who developed the approach known as the decoherent or coherent consistent histories approach. But even among these four workers, only Hartle um, actually set out new axioms for quantum theory based fundamentally on history, which didn't require the existence of Hilbert space of state. So motivated by trying to base quantum theory on histories and avoiding the problems that arise in the decoherent histories approach, Raphael Sorkin suggested the beginnings of an axiomatic basis for quantum theory which he called quantum measure theory. And in fact, 
although this, I won't be able to mention anything more about it than just this comment, um, he proposed an even more general setting, which he called generalized measure theory, which includes classical quantum and trans-quantum theories in a hierarchy um, characterized by the amount of interference um, that can occur between the histories. So to understand quantum measure theory, let's review the salient features of the classical stochastic theory first. So, every classical stochastic theory has the following structure. There is a sample space, which I call omega, of possible space-time histories. For example, there could be sequences of outcomes of um, 1,000 coin tosses, or uh, Wiener paths for a, a Brownian particle. There's an event algebra, which I'll call uh, Gothic A, whose elements are the possible questions that can be asked about the system. Or they, they, you can think of them as questions, you can think of them as, as, as propositions, you can think of them as predicates. Um, and this event algebra A has a Boolean structure. It's a Boolean algebra. Um, and it consists of subsets of the sample space. Then there's a measure, mu, on the event algebra, which encodes the dynamics and the initial conditions together. So both dynamics and initial conditions are in this measure. And finally, there's a single reality, one history, one element, gamma, of the sample space, which contains the answer, yes or no, to every, every possible question that, be, that can be asked. So, for example, omega, the sample space, could be the set of all weather patterns. Um, and A, this event, oops, this event A is a subset of the sample space. It's an, um, an element of the event algebra. And it could be the event it is raining. And it contains all of the weather patterns in which it's raining. Uh, and let's say gamma here, this is the real history. Um, and it's a weather pattern in which it's not raining. If the sample space is finite, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that throughout. It makes things um, uh, simpler. So then the event algebra is the uh, power set of the sample space, so it's all possible subsets of the sample space. Now, let's consider this event B. That's the event, it is dry and windy, so it contains all the weather patterns in which it's dry and windy. And if gamma is the realized history, and then we ask the question B, so is it dry and windy? then the answer would be yes. If we ask the question A, is it raining, then the answer is no. So given a particular reality, we can answer every um, question um, that can be asked about um, the physical system. So, therefore, reality, this single history, this one element of the sample space, this gamma, is equivalent to a map, which I'll call phi, from the event algebra to Z2, where phi of an event being zero means that that, oops, phi of A being zero means that the event doesn't happen, so the, or in other words, the answer to question A is no, and phi of A being one means the event A does happen, the answer to question a. It's a realized gamma, the realized history, is an element of that um, event A. This is the structure of ordinary classical Boolean homomorphic logic. I call it homomorphic logic because phi of A, this answering map, this, um, this truth valuation of all the questions that can be asked, is a homomorphism from the Boolean algebra of those questions, the uh, Boolean algebra propositions, or if you like, unassertive propositions to the truth values, that is a homomorphism, so this is homomorphic logic, it's the usual, ordinary, um, classical, um, logical structure. Okay. So there's also the measure, and in a classical theory, the measure encodes the both the dynamics and the initial state, and it's a positive real function on the event algebra. So for every event, there is a, oops, for every event A, mu of A is a positive, uh, a non-negative number, sorry. Um, and the function mu satisfies this sum rule, the Kolmogorov sum rule, that the measure of the disjoint union of a subset of an event A and an event B 
is the sum of the um, measures of the two subs, the two events A and B, and it's normalized to be one on the whole sample space. In the standard um, framework of classical stochastic theories, mu is interpreted, interpreted as a probability measure. So mu of A is the probability of event A. So if A and B are not disjoint, do you have a sort of similar thing for what is the intersection? Uh, yes. At the, at the measure of the intersection on the left hand side. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's uh, classical stochastic theory. Well, what about quantum theory from this space time perspective? Well, following Dirac and Feynman, we can again express the formulas of quantum mechanics in fully space time terms, in terms of histories. So in this form, quantum mechanics is much, has much of the same structure. And we just looked at, there's a sample space, um, omega of possible space-time histories. There's an event algebra, A, whose elements are, are some subsets of, um, of omega. There's a measure, mu, on the event algebra, which encodes both the dynamics and the initial state. Now, what, it, what are these things? Well, the sample space is the set of histories that go into this, that are summed over in the Feynman Dirac solo histories. The measure is less familiar. Roughly speaking, it's the mod squared of the sum of the amplitudes of all the histories in A. So if you want to ca uh, calculate the quantum measure of some event, you add up all the amplitudes of the, of the histories in that event and you square it, roughly speaking. Um, and for those who know about the consistent decoherent histories approach, it is the diagonal term of the decoherent term. So this way of thinking about quantum theory is not the textbook one, but these structures exist more or less, if you ask me, at the end I'll say why it was, for every quantum theory. And indeed, they furnish an alternative foundation from which the usual Hilbert space may be constructed. And for ordinary quantum mechanics, we have the theorem. This is what the most student, Stephen Johnson, has done with us. Okay, so we've got sample space, event algebra, and measure, those uh, in the same way that we had for um, classical theories. Can we also take over the, the final axiom? which was that one history happens. Okay, well, to answer that question, we have to look at quantum mechanics a bit more closely. So the quantum measure, mu, is also positive, I should say non-negative, sometimes it's zero, of course. So it's a non-negative real function on the event algebra. Um, and so the measure of any event, A, um, is non-negative number, but it does not, in general, satisfy the common law of some law because of quantum interference. Um, in the fami completely familiar way, so this you know already, the, um, the measure of an event A is given by the square, the square of the sum, so the measure of two disjoint events um, is again the square sum, so it's mu of A plus mu of B plus interference times in general. So this doesn't behave, this mu doesn't behave like an ordinary classical measure, it doesn't behave like probabilities. Um, however, it, although it doesn't satisfy the Kolmogorov sum rule, there's a generalized sum rule that it does satisfy, which involves the disjoint of three events. I don't have time to say any more about that. Okay, so because of the interference, mu can't be interpreted as a probability measure. So how then are we to use it for scientific purposes? How are we going to make predictions using mu? Well, going back to the classical case, we can ask the same question, in fact. How do we, in fact, use mu to do science? How do we, how do we, how do we um, deal with probabilities, in fact, when we actually do science and go out and test things? Well, the claim is, we, what we actually do, even in the classical case, is we identify events E such that the measure of E is very, very small. And then we say, typically, E does not happen. Uh, it is, or in other words, I'll introduce a term, a term here, precluded. So if an event E has a very small measure, then it's precluded. And we make the prediction that it, it's not going to happen. Okay. Now, this is known as Cournot's principle. It's first articulated by Bernoulli, and it occurs in Kolmogorov's um, uh, foundational um, work on um, book on um, probability theory. And if you want to look in there, it's um, called Principle B. 
And it's the interpretation of probability as applied to the real world that was held by Markov, Borel, Levy, and all other found founders of probability theory. And if you want to ask me, I can give you a reference for that claim that this, um, this interpretation of probability is uh, the one that held sway at the, um, <coughs> during the whole of the first half of the, of the 20th century. Okay, so let's adopt this Cornos principle in quantum measure theory. So we're going to say that whenever an event has very small measure, or uh, uh, in our case, the only, the, uh, we're only going to consider measure zero sense. Whenever an event has measure zero, it doesn't happen. That's the rule. And let's look at the uh, uh, three-slip experiment. So we have a source of particles here, a screen, three slits that the particles can go through, and um, an uh, ending screen here. And let's say we, we're going to consider all... Um, events where the, uh, the particle hits the screen at this point here, right here. And we arrange the slit separations of this distance to be such that the amplitude to go uh, for the particle to go through the middle slit and end up at this point is equal and opposite in sign to the amplitude for it to go through A and end up at this point. And also equal and opposite in sign to um, the one the, um, the amplitude to go through C and end up at that point. Okay. Right. So the the amplitudes are let for example minus one plus one plus one. Okay. So our sample space in this case consists of three histories, A, B, and C, where the um, particle goes through A, goes through B, or goes through C. Actually of course A contains many histories, many fine-grained histories, um, but the this simplification preserves the essential um, point that I want to bring out. Okay. Now there are two events of measure zero because the event A, the, the event which is the subset of the sample space which consists of history A and history B, what's the quantum measure of that? Well we take the amplitudes of A, amplitude B, add them up and square it, and that's zero. So this AB set is a, um, an event of measure zero and this BC set is an event of measure zero both have measure zero, and according to Cournot's principle, they don't happen. And that means that no sing in this case, no single history can happen, because these two sets of measure zero, their union is the full sample space. So the full sample space just has three histories. The subset AB has measure zero, the subset BC has measure zero, and that means that no single history can happen, because it can't be in a set of measure zero. So... So this means that we can't take over that axiom that reality consists of a single history in, um, in the quantum case, in quantum measure theory. So this example is not entirely um, conclusive because, of course, there are other positions on the screen that the particle can go to. So all we, we, um, we have a truncated um, sample space in which we force the, we, we're only interested in the, the trajectories where the particle ends up at a particular point on the screen. And there are other possibilities, so there are other things that the particle could do. Um, but there are other completely conclusive examples based on, um, for example, the cochrane specker theorem. And this is work that um, my student, uh, Yusuf Ghazi Tabathabai, has done. So this axiom, so we, it's a theorem, this axiom can't be, um, the axiom that one history happens can't be um, maintained in quantum measure theory. Okay, so what's the resolution? Well, what do we replace this one uh, history axiom with? And Sorkin has proposed an answer, and it can be given in many different forms, and you may like one, you may not like any of them, but you may like one more than um, the other, so I'll give you, um, give you um, one, and then I'll give you a couple of others. So here's the suggestion, that instead of a single history happening, what's real is a subset of histories, so a subset of histories is what is real. A, a subset of histories happens. And that subset is minimal subject to the preclusion condition. So what does that mean? Okay, well, here's a sketch of the sample space over again. Let's say F is the realized <coughs> subset of histories. F is the real, um, the, uh, the real um, subset. Quest and let's now see how we can answer all the questions in, the, in, our, um, in our event algebra. So, does event A happen? Well, here's event A. The answer is no, 
because our realised subset isn't completely contained in N. Um, so in general, if F is a subset of an event X, then X is true, X happens, or in other words, the truth value of X is 1. Um, otherwise, X is false. So if the, if the realised subset of histories is not contained in an event, then um, the, uh, the truth value of that event is 0. And F must not be contained in any precluded event. So if there are sets of measure 0 around, then F can't be contained in a set of measure 0. That's the, um, that's the preclusion condition. And this minimality condition says that there can't be any smaller subsets which are um, contained within F, which are um, also um, satisfy the preclusion condition. Okay. All right, here's another alternative way to think about this proposal. So let's focus attention on this answering map, phi, from the event algebra to Z2. So it's a, it, phi is an answer to every possible question that you can ask about the physical system. And we saw that in the classical case, phi was homomorphism. And I'm going to call it a, a co-event because phi, a co-event, because it maps events to numbers. Um, now we've seen that in some quantum setups, phi cannot be a homomorphism because being a homomorphism is, is entirely equivalent to reality being a single history. So if reality is not a single history, phi is not a homomorphism. So phi can't be a homomorphism, so what weaker condition should be imposed on phi on this answering map? Well, first of all, we have to impose Cournot's principle, or in other words, preclusion, and if the measure of an event is, oops, there should be an equal zero there. So if the measure of an event phi, uh, A is zero, then um, phi of A is zero. In other words, A doesn't happen. So, and here are three equivalent ways of, of giving, the, um, giving this condition on phi. The set phi to minus one of one, which is the set of all, sorry, there should be curly brackets around here, the set of all events such that um, Phi of, a, phi of that event is 1, is a filter. And that filter is maximal amongst filters which satisfy the preclusion condition. That's one condition. A second uh, completely equivalent condition <coughs> is that phi preserves multiplication, but not necessarily addition in the algebra um, in A. And it's the finest grain of such co-event. So in other words, A times B, which is A intersection B in the Boolean algebra of subsets of the sample space is equal to phi of a times phi of b. So phi preserves multiplication. If it also preserved addition, it would be a homomorphism. It's not, uh, we're not imposing the homomorphism condition. So it's, a, it's, multiplica it's multiplicative, but not additive. And it's the finest grained such co-event. And the third um, equivalent condition is that phi respects and, in other words, um, intersection, but not necessarily or, in other words, union, or n not necessarily um, x or um, And it's the finest grain of such co-event. So these are three um, equivalent conditions on this co-event, on this answering map. And if you notice, they all include a principle, what I would call a principle of maximal detail. They have to be the finest grain possible um, such co -event. And they're all, uh, all equivalent to the proposal that what's real is a subset of, um, of histories. Okay. So classical logic is a background assumption that's so basic that we do not notice we are making it. Logic here, as I said, means rules of inference uh, regarding the truth and falsity of statements about the physical world. And the claim is we use classical logic as an unquestioned background because in everyday life, one history happens. And I already claimed that um, one history happening is equivalent to this answering map being homomorphism. Um, and in everyday life, indeed, one history happens and we use classical logic to reason about everyday events. Okay, so here's an example. Um, back to weather patterns again. Let's say that... Um, this subset is the event that is raining, this event is the event that is windy, and um, here are some examples of rules of inference that we use all the time. Um, they're um, rules of inference that are contained in ordinary Boolean logic. If it is raining is true, 
and it is windy is true, then it is raining and windy is true. So, because if it's raining is true, if it's raining is true, then the real history must be in the event it's raining. And if it's windy is true, then the real history must be in the event it's windy. And therefore, it must be in the intersection. And therefore, if it's raining and windy, it's also true. Okay. Now, if when you first see a rule of inference like this, it's very difficult to, um, some, at first, when you first come across it, to um, comprehend how this can be actually a rule that you even need to state that, that you even need to state it as a rule of inference. Okay. That's what I mean by these logical rules being part of an unnoticed background, something so basic that we um, that, um, that it's hard to hard to even notice them. Here's another rule of inference. If it is raining is true, then it is dry is false. Because if the real history is in the event raining, then it's not in the complement of it's raining. So it's not in the event it's dry. Okay. And if it is raining is false, then if it is dry is true. So if um, it's not in the raining event, then the real history must be in, in the dry event. So what about our new proposal for a reality in quantum measure theory? Well, reality is now no longer a single history, it's coarse-grained, it's, a, it's a, set, a set of histories. And this leads to non-classical logic. Um, we already know that because um, logic, the classical logic is equivalent to the answering map being a homomorphism. If, um, I've already said that the answering map is no longer a homomorphism. But what kind of what kind of violations of our usual classical rules of inf inference can occur? Okay, well let's look at these um, our rules, the same rules of inference that we had before. Well, if raining is true and windy is true, what that means is that the realised subset must be um, contained in the event raining and it must be contained in the event windy. That means that it also must be contained in the, um, in the intersection and that means that, that um, raining and windy is also true. So this rule of inference, this particular one, still holds. So we're not throwing out absolutely everything about our classical rules of inference. Lots of things, lots of rules of inference still hold. So this one still holds. If raining is true, then um, not raining is false. Okay, well if raining is true, that means that our realized subset of histories is contained in the event raining. That means it's not in, it's not, um, not in the complement of raining. Um, so this rule of inference also holds. That's also um, still valid, a still a valid rule of inference in our um, in our new um, and homomorphic logic. But if raining is false, then not raining is true fails. This rule of inference cannot be um, cannot um, be held to be true. We can't make that deduction. And here's the example. I should have R and W for raining and windy here, but I've got A and B instead. Okay. So here's the um, situation. Let's say that A is um, the, the raining subset. And our, our real <coughs> subset of histories intersects A but is not contained in A. Then we ask the question, is it raining? The answer is no. We ask the question, is it, is it dry? And the answer is no, because the realized set of histories is not contained in either the event or its complement. So an event and its complement can be both be false in this um, algorithmic logic. Okay, so let's revisit the three switch experiment and um, see what our new uh, conception of reality uh, can do for us. So our rule is that a real uh, that reality doesn't have to be a single history now, it can be a subset of histories. But that set of histories cannot be contained in a set of measure zero. So the subset AB is a set of measure zero and the subset BC is a set of measure zero. So our real set of histories cannot be contained in AB and can't be contained in BC. There are only two possible subsets which satisfy that condition, either the subset AC or the whole sample space, A, B, and C. A, B, and C is not minimal, it's not the finest grained possibility because it contains <coughs> AC. So the unique minimal preclusive reality in this case is AC, 
and if you like, it's the base of the filter. Uh, we can answer any question, given this reality, we can answer any question. So, for example, does the particle go through slit A? No. Does the particle go through slit B? No. Does the particle go through slit C? No. Does it go through A or B? No. Does it go through A or C? Yes. The real properties are common properties of all the histories in the real set. It's a true, genuine coarse graining at the level of reality. The finer details of the histories are unreal. Now this is a very particularly simple example. In general, there won't be a unique, there won't be one um, minimal um, preclusive um, co-event that potential reality. There'll be a number of them. And when you've um, calculated what those are, all you can do is say that one of them is real. One and only one is real, um, but you don't know which one. And there's no extra information that you can put on it. There's no probability distribution, there's no extra measure that you can, um, that you can use to talk about those realities. The only thing you can say is that one of those realities, one of those co-events is the real thing, um, and, but you don't know which one. So I claim that some over history's quantum mechanics shares much of the same structure, much of the same framework as classical stochastic theories. There's a sample space of histories, an event algebra which is, um, consists of subsets of the sample space, and a measure. The event algebra is the, um, the crucial thing, somehow it's more, uh, you could think of it as being more fundamental than the sample space itself. The event algebra consists of all the questions that you can ask about the system, all the physical questions that you can ask about the system. Quantum interference, meaning that which results in this measure not being additive, not satisfying the corner of some law, and this um, law, or Corno's principle, that events of very small measure uh, <coughs> typically don't happen, means that the one history happens axiom must be given up. So not everything can be carried over from classical um, stochastic theories, classical measure theories, into quantum measure theory. We have to give something up, and that's the thing we have to give up. Or in other words, we have to give up the axiom that the answering map, phi, is a homomorphism. What do we replace that axiom by? Well, we can replace it by a number of different equivalent um, proposed, uh, axioms, one of which is that it's a set of histories that happens, and that maximal detail is achieved in reality. Another um, old, uh, completely equivalent way of, of giving that condition is that the answering map phi, from the event algebra questions to the truth values, is not necessarily a homomorphism, but preserves the um, multiplic multiplicity, <coughs> in, uh, multi it preserves multiplication in the Gaussian algebra, but doesn't necessarily preserve um, addition. Another way to say that is that the, um, the events of um, the events with, with truth value one, the events which happen, um, form um, a filter. Uh, the classical rules of inference are a consequence of the one history happens axiom, or in other words, they're the same thing. You assume one, you get the other. So, um, which is the axiom you, you can choose. Um, with the new axioms, classical logic is recovered when the measure <coughs> is classical. So that's something which I haven't um, showed for you. But if the measure happens to be classical, and we apply the rules that um, a set, it's a set of histories that happens, um, and the, that set of histories is the finest grain description <coughs> we can have, then we recover the, um, then we can deduce that that real set has to be a singleton set, that it contains only one history. So the new axioms reproduce the um, classical case in the, in the situation where the measure is classical. And that's somehow a pre I mean, you, you would need that in order to claim that this, um, this could be a, a new basis for, um, for a measure theory. So for viability, we need to show that in a fundamentally quantum theory, classical logic is recovered from macroscopic events. So what do I mean by that? Well, in our quantum measure theory, there are, um, we have uh, um, an event algebra, a Boolean algebra of, um, uh, of events, some of which uh, 
describe microscopic details of the system. But we can consider a subalgebra of that algebra, a subalgebra which contains only the macroscopic events. And what we mean by macroscopic is obviously subjective, but uh, at the very least it will contain um, events to do with positions of tables and chairs, uh, things like that. So that we can consider this macroscopic um, subalgebra, and we can ask how the realized the, the co-events are um, uh, what the uh, what the co-events restricted to this subalgebra look like. And what we would need would be that the co-events restricted to these um, macroscopic subalgebras would be homomorphic. If that if that would, if that's the case, then we know um, then um, we know that we'll never get violations of classical logic when we're talking at the level of tables and chairs and, um, and planets and galaxies. So if that if this doesn't turn out to be the case, then this Proposal, um, this proposal can't work, but we're pretty confident that um, that we can show that this um, that for, at least for laboratory physics um, we, we can we can prove the result. Of this. And if you notice, logic itself has become dynamical. So, for example, for some quantum measures, for example, if there are no sets of measure zero at all. And the preclusion condition is empty. If there are no sets of measure zero, then there's no, there are no precluded events. Then the axioms are that a set of histories happens, and that set of histories must be fi finest grained. There are no preclusion conditions, so you can fine grain all the way down to a single history. Single histories correspond to um, homomorphisms. They correspond to classical co-events. They correspond to classical logic, um, and so. If there are no sets of measure zero, then we can um, then we can use classical logic. So uh, all the physical co-events um, uh, could be homomorphisms, and they will be in this case if there are no sets of measure zero. But it's a it's a dynamical question. It depends on the measure. So in some situations um, you can use classical logic. In some situations you can't. And um, which rules of inference therefore becomes um, a question of the measure, a question of dynamics, and um, logic is. Therefore, part of physics, and I'll end there. Thanks. Questions, comments? Uh, please. Can I ask a question about the negation operation? Could you flick back very quickly where you had the asymmetry that R imply that not on a is false, not vice versa? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you have, you have this asymmetry. Yes. No, but that's, that's absolutely typical of intuitionistic logic, or some of the things you put that. Have you thought about it from that point of view? No. The, the R implies not not R and not vice versa is the classic intuitionistic logic sort of sign. Yes. Have... We would be very glad to, to find out that these ideas are already contained in some body of, of, of work and, and scholarship on a particular. Non-standard logics, but we we haven't been able to place it and to so place it so far. Mm -hmm. And that I mean, one 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 delicate issue here is what what do you mean by not? So there are two possible, at least two possible meanings to the word not in in this structure. So here, this not here meaning not R. This means simply the complement of R in the Boolean in in the sum of it. So it, it's it's just this algebraic um, operation, which uh, and, um, so it doesn't mean it doesn't say anything about happening or truth. It's just say, it, not R here. It's just the complement of R in the sum of things. Um, but not could also mean that the truth value. So not R could mean that the truth value of R was zero. In other words, that R doesn't happen. And it's in making a clear distinction between those two notions of not that we <coughs> find this structure to be extremely useful and we can't find it we can't find it set out in any, in, in the literature. That's so if, if you can point us to Well that's classic top off not yeah it's absolutely classic. Um, another question I wanted to ask you is if um, in our intersection of F and A you say if, if A is not contained in F, then the proposition is definitely false. Yes. Supposing A is almost contained in F, you know, 
it's almost pretty close. But if you look awkward, I was saying it's false. It's almost true. Does that make you feel a bit uneasy? Um, there are lots of things that make me feel uneasy. Like this. That is probably, probably one of the links. Well, in both of your hints, well, what they found is a probability thing. The way it's almost contained in there, couldn't you say actually it's true? Um. Almost true, isn't it? of almost and approximately, those are issues which we have swept completely under the carpet until now. So for example, I stated Corno's principle as the principle that when an event has very small measure, then, then it doesn't happen. How small is very small. That, so the, the, those, those issues of, of approximation are definitely there, um, and they need to be addressed, but I of course, if you allow yourself to use multi-value logic rather than just true and false, you have a couple of these problems. And then you have a precise quantification of it and it's true. And you believe the word truly in the family of things. Yes, that may be necessary, but uh, it helps me to understand what it means to have just true and false, so that I know that if, if, we, if the co event value is an event true, then if you, if you go and look, then you'll find that, it's, that it has happened, that it does happen. I remember when I was a student, when we were in the in the lab, I found a wonderful talk on statistics written by some obscure person, which, which told me that if you had an experimental result that shouldn't have been there, you'd be ignoring it. If you think about it, a student in physics, that's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it comes from the same, you know. Any other questions, comments? Steve? The, the, the very final thing it has on the last slide about the dynamics of logic is, is this sort of your insights into how the proposal would have to go, or is it is there some now technical um, you know mathematics where you've got this working out and you can see the, the, the logic behaving dynamic? Um, yeah, so we have various ex I mean we have various examples of um, quantum systems where you, where indeed you can see the see the um, see the co events some of the co events are Classical, some of the co events are um, non classical, they, they correspond, to, correspond to subsets and not single histories. So, yes. Uh, have you got any kind of uh, sort of more, more, more general um, idea of what the mathematical structure would be that allows kind of logic to, to dynamically change? Um, I think this is the proposal. I don't understand the question. Well, okay. So, so, so I think what you're telling me is you've got some examples where, where you can see that one logic might be uh, appropriate in one case and one logic might be appropriate in another. Yes. So yeah. for example, the, the two-slit experiment, with just two, yeah. two histories, there are no sets of measure zero. So, so in fact, in the two-slit experiment, the co-events aren't just classical. They are, the particle goes through one slit or it goes through the other slit. There are two possibilities and we don't know which one. And that's the, so that's an example. What, what I'm asking is, yes. have you got some kind of meta model where the, where the logic itself would, would appear as an ingredient in, in, the, in physics and then have, um, <coughs> as part of the, the mathematics and the physics, the logic changes? I'm still not really understanding the question, so let's discuss it. Andreas? Uh, aren't you worried about the fact that the two-slit experiment um, becomes trivial in this description? I mean, uh, most people would say, as you said, this is um, the epitome of, of quantum, yes. quantumness. And it's, isn't it strange that this becomes trivial? Perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> it's also strange. But, um, yes. I've, I mean, it, throughout this, the work that we've done on this, I found that my, my intuition about the way things should go has been wrong basically all the time. I don't trust what I feel <laughs> anymore. So maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not, I don't know. I can't tell it. So you're going to use the, the idea is to use the Feynman uh, paths to define your histories or Yes. Uh, and then is there any problem if you switch from you know one set of coordinates to another or you know change bases or anything? 
Yeah, so the, 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 the axioms require a choice of, of, um, of what, your, what, what your set of histories will be. So, um, and in ordinary quantum mechanics, the choice that, the obvious choice is, the, is to use trajectories, um, space time trajectories as those, as those histories. So you need to make a choice. So that's, that, that gets added in the beginning. Yes, yeah, so that's part of the axiomatic basis. So you make some statements about that. Because otherwise you will go into the Bertrand paradox, yes? I mean, if you would change the, uh, the choice of uh, coordinates of the starting space, yes? Say that again. I mean, uh, well, in the continuum probability theory, yes, there is a question about actually how we, how we set up the probabilities with respect to the... Uh, to the well, basic probability space, yes, and we can. I mean, this is the the point of Bertrand paradox that to somehow. To so some what paradox? Bertrand paradox. It's a. Uh, it's about the that you can give different probabilities. I mean, when you consider not mm, discrete but continuous probability distributions. So in this case, you, s you speak about probability measures. You can, uh, I would say. Uh, the change of coordinates, starting uh, coordinates, gives you different results, and it, it depends on, I would say, some kind of uh, subjective choice. Well, it's uh, well. well the idea it, is that there's it, no subjective choice. It's uh, it's part of the theory. You say mm -hmm. part of the theory is to give the the history, the space of histories at the beginning. So All right. Yes, they become that's right. There are no there are no sets of measure zero in, in that case. So that's true too. Yes, unless you do unless you do a run of many many uh, so one single EPR run, there will be no sets of measure zero. But if you do many of them, then gradually you'll uh, some of the Amplitudes will, will start to start to give you zero um, start to give you sets of measure zero. In other words, and they correspond to the to the um, to this the the runs which whose statistics are the ones which are not predicted by quantum mechanics. So there will be there will be precluded sets when you do many many runs of a. For a single thing, it's trivial. For a single thing, the the logic is trivial. It's, uh, the logic is classical. So what happens to quantum information theory? Does it all become quick? Um, no, it's, everything is still it, it, everything is still there. So the the the, the mesh I and mean the, the the dynamics, the unitarity, the Superposition is all still there in the measure, but, it, but just in this in this case, the the logic is, is in this particular case, the logic is possible. Uh, okay. I actually have one comment. Like it's sort of an old paradigm in mean, quantum logic community that non conmogrovian measure is the same as non commutative uh, algebra of observers. It's the same as non distributivity of the levels. And then the sort of problems Chris was mentioning that actually your logic is becomes trivial when describing compound system interaction like in the Bell experiment was one of the big problems of quantum logic that they never could say anything meaningful about that at the moment more than one system came into play quantum logic failed and I think that's the failure of quantum logic and why it never had any impact and how don't you think that this would be subject to exactly the same kind of problems and no, it's, it's still not, very close no, it's not quantum logic and it's it's not what you said at the beginning. So say what you, your so original like, comment like about something being the same as something yeah, being the same the, the, the that, That's just not true. Of the measure is, is tightly connected with the non-distributivity of the lattice. So that's not true here. So, so we, the, the, the measure is, non, is, uh, is not added. It's not a, it doesn't satisfy the common law. <coughs> but, but we're not replacing the Boolean algebra propositions with anything with the lattice, with, with with projection operator, the the 
the propositions, the structure of the, prop the set of propositions is the same. It's still boolean. So what you said at the beginning is not the case. So it doesn't. So this is an example of having a, uh, a measure which, which is not um, a standard classical measure satisfying the common God rules. But there's no sign of, of, of some, um, uh, projection operators and, and um, non-distributive lattices. So there's no, there isn't a type connection because here's an example where there's no. Okay, and if you have a coherent theory of a composite system, and if you apply your structure to two systems, and then apply it to the composite of two, is there some sort of neat way of saying what goes on? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The sample space would be the product, the event algebra would be. What about the measures? Um, That's where the EPR correlation comes from. Yes. Well, uh, so the, measure, the measures will be constructed from the some of the histories, so we would use the usual dialect. It won't be the product if they're interacting. Yeah. Well, so it seems that what you're looking at is, is to try to find the carrier of a certain measure by taking the intersection of all these sets of measure one. It seems correct that uh, the sets of measure one are true, and you want to have the minimal one of those. Um, so in general, this sets is not of measure one don't uh, aren't relevant. So the only the only me the only uh, measure that we're interested in is zero. So it's sets of measure zero, which which give us the dynamical rules, and um, the so having a set of measure zero means that, that that if an event has measure zero, then that event is false, is valued zero by the by the by the reality by the well, co-event Ah, the, 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 the they're diff, um, your, the or the events which are valued one by the co-event, which is not the measure, those form a filter. So, can you express your question again? Um. So, uh, so given a yeah, given a reality, there is, you can consider all the events which are that which are true, um, uh, and that that is that set of events is a filter. Yes. yes. So so I see a similarity with things going on in volcanic measure theory, but, but maybe I yeah, the, the thing that Alex is working on, and, and what also we used in our work in chemistry, but maybe we should explain and uh, talk about sure. some. I think uh, we should thank the speaker and move on to the